Today's video is sponsored by CookUnity. CookUnity is the first chef to you meal delivery service made up of over 70 different chefs who believe great food should be available for everyone, regardless of anyone's culinary skill set. We are all guilty of ordering dinner or lunch from overpriced delivery apps that have you paying double, if not triple, for food that half the time arrives cold or soggy. I myself, as well as most everyone that I know, is guilty of this, and this is where CookUnity shines. Unlike meal prep plans or buying all of the ingredients from the grocery store and worrying about freshness and cost, CookUnity does all of the work for you, sending you exactly what you need for an amazing eating experience. Each week, award-winning chefs craft hundreds of globally inspired meals from vegetarian to paleo and everything in between. Meals are delivered fresh, never frozen, and the menu rotates every week, so there's always something new to try. And the best part is the simplicity of every order. You won't have to worry about cutting, measuring, marinating, adding this, and then waiting for that to simmer. Instead, you simply unbox your meal, toss it in the oven, and boom. Within a few minutes, you'll have a meal that you are actually going to enjoy. And I do mean enjoy, such as my meals like this delicious Kraft cheeseburger with special sauce made by Chef John DeLucy, or the flavor explosion that is the tender braised beef with daikon radish by Chefs Yang Zhao and Wanting Zhang. And I can't forget the delectable taste of JG's short rib mac and cheese by Chef Jose Garcis. These are just three of the more than 150 different meals that Cook Unity offers, all made by experienced chefs, something that you can definitely tell in the taste. Also, the subscription is super flexible and you can pause, skip weeks, and cancel at any time. So, if you are ready to start looking forward to dinner time again, go to cookunity.com forward slash cadaver50 or click the link in the description and use my code cadaver50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals to try them out for yourself. Again, use code cadaver50 for 50% off your first order. Thanks again to Cook Unity for sponsoring today's video. They say that you can never truly know someone 100%, regardless of if it's a friend or a family member. It's a statement that unfortunately, too many of us can relate to. Maybe it was being betrayed by someone we saw as a best friend. Maybe it was being put into a situation that was inappropriate by a family member. Or maybe it was something even worse. This seemed to be the case for the Redditor going by the handle, Corrupted and her experience with her stepfather and stepbrother, who might possibly be responsible for something that went well past Reddit, something that has gone unsolved in Australia for over 30 years. Scared and confused. Was I raised by Mr. Cruel? Hi fellow Redditors. Not too sure if this is even where I should be or even if I should be posting this. It's been on my mind for decades now, at least 30 plus years, and it has always terrified me. Although I have no definitive evidence, the coincidences are just too much. To start with, I am only mentioning all of this because I know it's anonymous, and if it wasn't, then there is no way I would even consider mentioning any of this in a public form. I grew up in an extremely abusive household. My mother displays narcissistic personality disorder. My stepfather is a pedophile, and his oldest son is an alcoholic, a compulsive liar, and also is a pedophile. Sadly, I know this from first-hand experience, and also know that I am not the only person that was afflicted by their attentions. 
My mother did nothing about the situation. In fact, she often deliberately put me in compromising positions, leaving me in their custody or turning a blind eye when she had undeniable evidence that something had occurred. Although this group is about unsolved murders and not other forms of abuse, this will all make sense as it is intertwined. When I was about 11 years old, I lived in the state of Tasmania in Australia. My eldest stepbrother had moved interstate to Victoria to join the army, and I was just relieved for the break from his presence. When he completed his basic training, my stepfather and mother went for a trip to Victoria to watch my stepbrother march out, which is a ceremony at the end of their training to signify that they were now full serving members of the defense force. They were gone interstate for approximately a two week period. My dates are not 100% accurate, but they were gone from about late August to somewhere to mid-September. I remember this clearly because once they came back to Tasmania, they had nothing but praise about mainland Australia. Tasmania is an island state, and they wanted to move there. We were packed and ready to move very fast and were gone in just over two weeks after their return. We arrived in Melbourne on the 5th of October, 1987. Not long after we moved to Melbourne, there was an awful case on the news about a man who was abducting young girls from their homes and abusing them. One of his last victims that I was aware of was a young girl named Carmen Chan. Although I was so young at the time and often ignored whatever news stories were on the news at the time, this stuck with me because we often ate dinner with the television on at the same time. Whenever something came on the news about Carmen Chan and the abductor that the media had dubbed Mr. Cruel, my stepfather would snap at me and insist that I shut up and keep quiet while he listened. He would turn the television up louder and become very focused on whatever the news was reporting. Mr. Krull had abducted a few girls leading up to this point and had mostly just assaulted them before he left them somewhere where they would be discovered and returned to their families. In Carmen Chan's case, however, she was never returned and eventually she was found deceased. My stepfather's abnormally intense interest in the news surrounding these cases always confused me as he most certainly did not concern himself with my welfare and there was plenty of violent news on television for him to absorb, so I had no idea why he was so interested in Mr. Cruel. He did have some peculiar interest as he used to own a collection of booklets printed about serial killers in our home library. I did not read them all, as I was too young and really had no interest in the subject at the time, but I remember a book about Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. Of course, this is not illegal to possess and on its own, not entirely suspicious. But if you combine it with the rest of my post, then perhaps it will appear to be a little dubious. Anyway, it wasn't until I was much older that I started to question as to why my stepfather seemed so interested in Mr. Krull at the time. That's when I started to read up on what little information the police had on their criminal slash murderer. They believed that he was in the defense force, I think because of the way that he was so clean and left behind no evidence or minimal evidence. At the time of these abductions and murders, my stepbrother was in the army, but my stepfather was also a manic neat freak. He would make me wash the hubcaps of the car with a toothbrush when I was cleaning the car. And one day, he even went on a meltdown because I left a tiny ink mark on the front page of a newspaper while I was checking to see if my pen was working. His tidiness was a compulsion. The one piece of physical evidence that apparently Mr. Krull left behind was a whisker. So, the police thought that they were looking for a red-headed man because the whisker was red. Both my stepfather and my stepbrother are brunette, unless they grow facial hair, and they both have red facial hair. The police also thought that their suspect was from either Tasmania or New Zealand due to some of the colloquialism language that the abducted girls heard. I cannot recall the exact phrase that was released to the media, I just know that when I read it at the time, I recognized it as something that my stepfather and stepbrother would use. They often used colloquialisms such as, how do you like them apples, or how does that grab you, in a sadistic condescending tone. This is just a couple of the many that they used. 
Also, at the time of the abductions and the abuse and murder, all of the victims were female and all of them were the same age as myself. Lastly, the last coincidence that comes to mind at the moment in this timeline, from what I read in the media, they believe that the first abductions from Mr. Krull occurred sometime in either late August or mid-September of 1987. I cannot recall the exact date, I just remember how ill it made me to know that both my stepfather and stepbrother were both in Victoria at the time this happened. And the last victim they believe Mr. Krull abducted was either in September or very early October in 1992. These dates are important because against my wishes and against my stepfather's wishes, my mother insisted that we move back to Tasmania and we left Victoria on October 5th, 1992, just after Mr. Krull's last apparent abduction before he went quiet in Victoria. Around the same time that we moved back to Tasmania, my stepbrother moved from Victoria to Queensland, so now both my stepfather and stepbrother were no longer in Victoria, although both of them had been there during the times that Mr. Krull was active. Both my stepfather and stepbrother have a sadistic streak, and I honestly believe that after living with them for 13 years, that either one of them was quite capable of doing those acts. My stepbrother was, however, a little skittish and anxious when he was being abusive, but my stepfather always kept his composure. At the time that Mr. Krull was active, we lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, which is where Carmen Chan's body was found, and so did my stepbrother. Her body was found only a couple of suburbs away from where we resided. My stepfather does not appear to fit the physical description of Mr. Krull, as he is quite short, but my stepbrother does. It would not even surprise me if they had acted if it was them as a pair, because each of them knew the other's fetishes and sadistic behaviors, and each of them covered for each other. At the time that Mr. Krull was active, I would also like to note that at least one of his victims stated that they could hear airplanes overhead when they were abducted. We lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne at the time, not too far from an international airport and underneath the flight path of many of the flights. Also, one of the descriptions of a room that one of the girls was kept in matches up with what I can remember from one of my stepbrother's rooms when he was living out of our home for a while. My stepbrother never lived on the barracks when we moved to Melbourne. He either rented his own place or he moved back with us for a while. The only time that I recall that he lived on base was just before we moved back to Tasmania. At this time, he was married and he was working as a chef at a communications depot. Because this depot was so small and in a rural area, and because he was married, he was provided a house on the depot site to live in with his wife at the time. Because he was a chef and the depot was so small, he was the only chef that I was aware of, so it was essential that he be available on site to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinners, so living at the depot was pretty essential. I also recall his really odd behavior, which may not have anything to do with this case, but it was not uncommon to find him vacuuming his house or hanging washing out of the back to dry at 1am. This may have something to do with him being a chef and working hours that were different than most, just getting household chores done when he could, but he was also an extreme neat freak, and I hated spending time there to keep his wife company because as a 16-year-old girl, I did not appreciate being woken up to help vacuum or hang the washing up so late at night. I mentioned all of this to a police officer years ago. All I can recall was that she was part of a task force at the time. She did ask me to get back to her, but I had a house fire and lost all of her contact details. Since then, I have never been able to locate them again since, and I have no idea what her name was. I really don't remember, although I really wish I did. I truly believe that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this whole Mr. Cruel incident. It terrifies me to think that perhaps their dislike for me or their passion to be sadistic towards myself is possibly why they chose targets that were brunette and of the same age as myself. There is a saying in Australia which is, you don't shit where you eat, which means if you are going to commit a crime, you don't do it in your backyard because 
it's just too close to your home. So the thought of them lashing out at these young ladies instead of myself is just sickening. Of course, I have no definitive proof on me. If I did, they would most certainly be in prison as I type this. Obviously, I have nothing to do with them at all anymore. Whenever I was abused, it was either psychological and sadistic, which is just impossible to prove to authorities unless there is a non-biased witness, or the abuse left any marks on my body, which again, is pretty difficult to prove. My mother once told me when I was 14 that if I ever went to the police, she would lie, and then she asked me who I thought a judge would believe, her or a teenage girl. I was terrified to go to the authorities because I thought no one would believe me. And then the aftermath would be much, much worse for me. Since then, however, I have had my stepbrother charged, and he did end up spending some time in jail for some of the crimes committed against me, although most of them have gone unpunished. I don't hold any malice about that, and I'm impressed that the Victorian police were able to put together a case on what information they had, and that they were able to charge him at all. This does not alleviate my concerns about the Mr. Cruel case though. There are so many coincidences that I find frightening. 1. The intense interest in the media coverage of the cases. 2. All of the victims being the same age and having the same hair color as myself. 3. Living in the approximate area where he was committing the crimes. 4 their facial hair being the same as the sample found at the crime scene. Five, their colloquialisms that match Mr. Cruel's pattern of speech. Six, the time frames that Mr. Cruel was committing his crimes match the times that both of my family members were in Victoria. Seven, living in the northern suburbs, we lived close to the international airport and underneath the flight path of airplanes. Eight, my stepfather's compulsion for tidiness, and my stepbrother being in the army at the time that Mr. Krull was active. 9. Mr. Krull's activities seemed to cease when both my stepfather and stepbrother moved interstate from Victoria. 10. My stepfather's fascination with serial killers. And 11. My family coming from Tasmania, as the police believed that Mr. Krull was either Tasmanian or from New Zealand. This is an awful lot of coincidences concerning one case, or one offender. I guess all of these coincidences don't really amount to a criminal case, but it has left me feeling ill, terrified, and with no one to talk to about this. I did try to mention it to my biological father once, a few years ago, but I think he thought perhaps I was overreacting as he was not aware of the abuse I had endured as a child. I never told him about any of this, even when my stepbrother was charged and went to jail. My biological father had no idea why, and had no idea that my mother was aware, and that his father was also a part of it all. I can't shake the horrible feeling I feel like I was raised by a serial abuser. Well, that one I know is a certainty, and a murderer who had no problem in taking the life of a young girl. I know that either of them are capable of such actions, although if I was asked to choose which one I thought it would most likely be, the physical attributes match my stepbrother, but the calmness of Mr. Krull is something that was more often displayed by my stepfather, so I don't really know, but I am very sure that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this case. I just don't know who to approach who will take all of this seriously. I also have a family of my own now, and I don't want them to hear about any of it. I have to be careful because I don't want to expose my children to these kinds of images or thoughts. Lastly, I would just like to add for those who question as to whether or not my thought process about this situation is stable. I had to be psychologically assessed as part of the legal requirements when I had charges pressed against my stepbrother. The courts need to assure that the person making those kinds of allegations are mentally aware of their accusations and that there is no sign of mental illness where they may have misinterpreted a situation. Yes, there are psychological effects. 
I suffer from PTSD, but honestly, if you knew the true horrors of the home I grew up in, then you would be amazed if anyone could endure such an upbringing and walk out of that home without any emotional baggage. If anyone who reads this knows of a person amongst the Victorian Police Task Force who would be interested in talking with me, I have no problem with this and would appreciate a way to contact them. As I type this, I am sitting here shaking as I recall my old home and what those poor girls had to endure and poor Carmen who probably did nothing wrong other than view his face. My heart goes out to her family but I am so scared that her family would bear a grudge towards me, even though I have nothing to do with the whole situation and was the same age as their Carmen, grief can make someone view perspectives differently. I would be ashamed to face them unless I was able to assist them in getting some kind of justice. I have not mentioned any names other than that of Carmen Chan, who was one of his victims. I have not mentioned the exact suburbs or exact information, as if this is of interest to the police, I don't want to jeopardize any possible investigation and outcome by posting information publicly before an official investigation is done. Nor do I want to cause any possible biased opinions, as this could affect the outcome of a court hearing. I am not saying that my step family members will ever be charged or go to court or that they are definitely guilty, but I will not take the risk of ruining any chances of possible justice just so that I can tell my story on Reddit. Thanks for reading. Perhaps someone will respond with some kind of information or advice. So, before digging into the post that Corrupted made, I feel it's important to give some background on who Mr. Cruel was. Mr. Cruel is the name given to an unidentified person who was responsible for sexually assaulting three children in the late 80s in Melbourne, Australia. He was also a prime suspect in the murder of a 13-year-old in 1991. The victim, Carmen Chan, was abducted from her home on the night of April 13, 1991, and her body was found almost a year later, a little over 10 miles away from her home. As of the date of this upload, Carmen's murder is still unsolved, as are the three six little holes on the other victims. So, what OP is stating in her post is a very serious accusation to make against a person or persons. Mr. Cruel his crimes, and his victims are all real. They're not some story that's been cooked up online or some elaborate ARG. Adding that with OP's post and genuine concern and fear that they feel around this does add to its credibility. And while she has no pictures or evidence other than recountings from a mind on events that happened 30 years ago is iffy, Something about how she told the story and some of the pieces of information on dates when the family would move does eerily line up with the actual facts from the case and attacks. As OP stated, her stepfather and stepbrother displayed traits that were similar to Mr. Krull and the dates at which her family moved to areas surrounding where the crimes occurred is suspect. Going even deeper into something that stood out to me was an officer assigned to the case stated that it was believed that there could be as many as a dozen victims that could be tied to Mr. Krull. The only problem was that there was no physical evidence left at the scene. As OP stated, police did recover a hair from the crime, but there were no forensic evidence that was left behind. Police also stated that Mr. Krull was meticulous about his crimes, making sure to conduct surveillance on his victims, as well as always keeping his face covered and, oddly enough, sticking to a very tight schedule. One example of this was from the third victim who told police that her abductor told her that he would release her in exactly 50 hours, and he did at exactly the 50-hour mark. OP also stated that her stepfather used several different colloquialisms and Mr. Krull was reported by his victims to use various ones as well, such as war reward and use. Now, obviously that can't be considered evidence since it was such a common term used in that area as well as that age range. But what it could do is help OP's case that she could be onto something. But what I have to point out is narrative. We as readers can get a sort of tunnel vision about things and we can start to bend or stretch narratives to make them fit in a way that we want them to. 
True, OP has no evidence that her stepfather or stepbrother are in fact Mr. Krull, but the points that she brings up as well as the timelines do make this story interesting. Another thing that stood out to me was her demeanor throughout the entire post. She seemed genuinely scared to even be posting about it and keeps details about herself and her family very vague in fear of her other family finding out about her as an adult. She goes into detail about personal things involving her current family and how she worries about their safety as well. And given the abuse that she endured as a child and a young teen, it's warranted for her to be vague about details. OP mentions through further comments that she has attempted several times to get police involved and that she had been turned away almost every time due to a lack of any evidence. And to the police's credit, they are right. I'm sure they have a person making this claim, but without any evidence, then they have nothing to bring charges against them other than a few circumstantial things. OP stating that they did live in the area during the times the attack occurred, as well as mentioning her stepfather's obsession with detail and organization, is strong enough, at least for me, to not rule out her story. The biggest thing though that stands out as an issue for me is that even if we take away this post and solely focus on Mr. Krull and his crimes, there have been no new victims or major updates to the case in decades. It is still an ongoing investigation, yes, but with no other reported victims confirmed since 1990, it makes this case very difficult. I mean, hell, I wasn't even born by the time the last attack occurred. There are theories on the topic involving the only murder victim, Carmen Chan, and that with her death it caused Mr. Krull to simply stop the attacks and go on with his normal life, but rarely is that the case. 33 years is a very long time to lay low. Perhaps Mr. Krull died, maybe he was arrested for another crime altogether, but for me at least, I don't think that he simply just stopped. The police are no closer to catching him than they were at the time of the attacks. So with virtually no clue to your identity, a case being incredibly cold and with so much time in between the attacks since the last one, Mr. Krull seemingly got away with his acts and would have been able to carry on his crime spree, yet he didn't. There are countless theories on this case. And this Reddit post is just the tip of a very large iceberg. So much so that if there is enough interest on this topic, I have no problem making a full dedicated video on Mr. Krull. And as for OP, she may be right. She may have been sleeping in the same house as one of Australia's most elusive criminals. A person who seemed to be the embodiment of the boogeyman. Something that has always been a little unnerving to me is the fact of how many cameras are out there. Walk into any store, use any computer, hell, grab your phone that's sitting next to you, or look at the one that you're currently watching this video on, and you realize there's a camera on it. A lens that shows you silently. Yet, we could have no idea it's happening. People have an unease of cameras being on them for obvious reasons. We all would be uncomfortable being filmed and not knowing that it was happening. It's an invasion of privacy that is unique only to cameras. And while we all have an idea of how we would handle a being in a situation of being unknowingly recorded, what happens when it's not you? What do you do when you realize that you are not the target but instead, the unexpected audience. This is exactly what happened with one Redditor who has since deleted their account. Yet their post is still up for all to see. This is one story of how humans truly are scarier than any movie monster that Hollywood can cook up. A true, very creepy surveillance story. So first of all, I only just discovered this subreddit today, which reminded me of something that happened to me back in 2008. This was a huge thing to my friends and family, and I didn't really want to talk about it back then as it scared the fuck out of me. 
but it was a while ago and it is a really well-known creepy story among myself and my friends and family but i think i may as well share it as it is admittedly terrifying i was living with my parents and sister in brisbane australia at the time 2008 which means i was 19. I remember my dad had just gotten Foxtel, cable TV in Australia, but only the TV in the lounge room could use the cable box, and I really wanted to somehow get cable in my room without paying $99 or whatever it was for a new box. So dad went out one day and bought an AV transmitter and receiver. It was basically a two-piece bit of hardware where you would plug this tiny box into the cable TV in the lounge room and it would transmit a video signal to the receiver connected to the TV in my room. So one Saturday, I decided to connect it. This is a picture I took of the setup when I was telling my friend the story. My younger sister, 16 at the time, was the only other person at home at the time. She was upstairs in her room, and my room is downstairs. I opened the box and connected it to the TV. At first, I was going back and forth, trying to get the cables right and trying to get the channel right, but no luck, until I finally got something. I remember just sitting there, and something started fuzzing in, and this is where things start to feel like a horror movie. I remember thinking, oh, here we go, and waiting to see the picture come in clearly. As it started fuzzing in, I remember that this whole time the cable set-top box wasn't even on, and that's why it wasn't working this whole time. But then, why was I getting a signal? It seemed to hit me all at once. As I realized the box was off, the picture fuzzed in, and I saw a bed. I freaked the fuck out, as at first I thought it was my bed. I had recently seen Saw 2 and remembered that scene where she turns on the TV and it's a camera filming her in her apartment. That was the first thing that I thought of. I sprinted upstairs to my sister, absolutely terrified. I told her to come down and take a look. She came down and we both realized that it wasn't my bed. We didn't know whose bed it was or how I was getting the signal. Obviously, it was the AV receiver picking up a camera signal, but we were just so confused as to who or what it was for. Eventually, my parents came home and we concluded that it would have to be a neighbor or someone living close by for us to be receiving the signal. We waited around until about 6 p.m. and then someone came into the room. My dad recognized it as one of our neighbors. We still don't know what the camera was for, but we assumed it had something to do with Fidelity. Either his wife or he had set it up to watch the other and see if they were cheating. Either this, or it was to tape themselves having sex. We entertained the idea that he was a murderer and would film himself murdering people in this room, but just to freak each other out. We'd always make jokes about how one night we'll turn it on and it'll just be his face with clown makeup on, staring at the camera, waving, and then him walking out of the bedroom with a knife. This never happened, but what did happen was still super creepy. We connected to this signal for over a week, but after a few days, the novelty kind of wore off. We felt a bit weird watching it and just resigned to the explanation that it was to catch his wife cheating until one day we turned it on and realized what we had discovered. Our neighbors were having a bunch of renovations done to their house. During weekdays they would be out and there would be more workers at the place pretty much all day. It had been like this for over a month. We started watching the feed and saw a man walk into their room. It was the plumber that had been there regularly for the renovations. We didn't think anything of it until he started opening drawers. I called to my mom, the only person at home at the time, and we started watching it. He started going through the wife's underpants and sniffing them, doing all that creepy shit. At first we were like, oh my God, how embarrassing, he's being filmed, will the neighbors see this somehow? But then what happened next was truly terrifying. He slowly walked over to the camera 
and looked right down the fucking lens. We were convinced that he knew we were watching. Mom immediately called Dad and I kept watching. He started fiddling with it and then put it back down. I told mom that I don't think he knew that we were watching, but he is definitely the guy that put the camera there. Dad came home and by this time the plumber had left. Much to mom's pleading, dad went over to the neighbors to tell them what we saw. Mom wanted to completely stay out of it and was terrified, understandably. When we told the neighbors, they had no idea what we were talking about. They allowed dad to go up to their room and what he found that was holding the camera was an installed device in the wall that was designed to monitor water usage, which was completely normal at the time as Brisbane had been hit with a drought recently and there were lots of water restrictions. The plumber had installed this into the wall but he had fitted a camera behind it in the wall to watch the bed. Immediately, they called the police, who came over and conducted an investigation. For the next week or so, we didn't hear much about it. I spent most of this time just telling my friends, showing them pictures, but truthfully, my whole family was scared every night. It was just very creepy thinking that we could have stuff like that hidden in our house. Chances are we didn't, but it was still really scary. After a couple of weeks, my mom was speaking to the wife next door and asked her what happened with all of it. The wife said that the police found out that he would, at nights, come to our street and sit in his car, which had really tinted windows, and would watch them on his laptop. When mom told me this, I got the biggest shivers. The reason was, besides the obvious of a creepy dude sitting in his car watching people through a hidden camera, was because on multiple nights when I had driven home late from my girlfriends or walked home drunk after a night out, I remember seeing a station wagon always about 30 meters down the street from our house. It was never there during the day, always at night. I'd always walk past it and look at my reflection in the windows assuming that no one was inside. I was always so confused by whose car it was but literally never thought that it was anything. It still scares me so much that it was just this creepy fucking plumber sitting back in there on a laptop watching a hidden camera stream of my neighbors. There are many things to be afraid of in the world we live in. If anything, that fear has been increased due to channels such as this covering topics on what is the worst day of a person's life. Yet we as an audience can't get enough of it. Some of us will offer up an excuse as to why we watch this type of content as a guilty pleasure. Others will say that they are learning what not to do in a situation if they were ever to find themselves in one. But what happens when you come across something that isn't going to go bump in the night? It's not some hooded killer in a dark alley with a knife. It's not a creepy neighbor who put cameras in your house. Instead, it's silent. And once it's discovered, it's too late. That is exactly what user Ziri Masterpiece informed people of when making their submission on what was the scariest thing that they could think of was. Rabies is scary. Rabies, it's exceptionally common but people don't just run into the animals that carry it often, skunks especially, and bats. Let me paint you a picture. You go camping, and at midday you decide to take a nap in a nice little hammock. While sleeping, a tiny little brown bat in the rage stage of the infection is fidgeting in broad daylight, uncomfortable and thirsty due to the hydrophobia, and you snort, startling him and then he goes into attack mode. Except you're asleep and he is a little brown bat and weighs around six grams. You don't even feel him land on your bare knee and he starts to bite. His teeth are tiny, hardly enough to even break the skin, but he does manage to give you the equivalent of a tiny scrape that goes completely unnoticed. Rabies does not travel in your blood in fact, a blood test won't even tell you if you've got it. 
antibody test may be done, but are useless if you've ever been vaccinated. You wake up none the wiser. If you notice anything at the bite site at all, you assume you just lightly scraped it on something. The bomb has been lit, and your nervous system is the wick. The rabies will multiply along your nervous system, doing virtually no damage and completely undetectable. You literally have no symptoms. It may be four days, it may be a year, but the camping trip is most likely long forgotten. Then one day, your back starts to ache, or maybe you get a slight headache. At this point, you're already dead. There is no cure. The sole caveat to this is the Milwaukee Protocol, which leaves most patients dead anyway, and the survivors mentally disabled, and is seldom done. There is no treatment. It has a 100% kill rate. Absorb that. Not a single other virus on the planet has a 100% kill rate, only rabies. And once you're symptomatic, it's over. You're dead. So what does it look like? Your headache turns into a fever and a general feeling of being unwell. You're fidgety, uncomfortable, and scared. As the virus that has taken its time getting into your brain finds a vast network of nerve endings, it begins to rapidly reproduce, starting at the base of your brain where your pons is located. This is the part of the brain that controls communication between the rest of the brain and the body, as well as sleep cycles. Next, you become anxious. You still think you only have a mild fever, but suddenly you find yourself becoming scared, even horrified, and it doesn't occur to you that you don't know why. This is because the rabies is chewing up your amygdala, as your cerebellum becomes hot with the virus, you begin to lose muscle coordination and balance. You think maybe it's a good idea to go to the doctor now, but assuming a doctor is smart enough to even run the tests necessary in the next few days you have left on the planet, odds are they'll only be able to tell your loved ones what you died of later. You're twitchy, shaking, and scared. You have the normal fear of not knowing what's going on, but with the virus really fucking the amygdala, this is amplified a hundredfold. It's around this time the hydrophobia starts. You are horribly thirsty. You just want water, but you can't drink. Every time you do, your throat clamps shut and you vomit. This has become a legitimate act of fear of water. You're thirsty, but looking at a glass of water begins to make you gag and you shy back in fear. The contradiction is hard for your hot brain to see at this point. By now, the doctors will have put you on IVs to keep you hydrated, but even that's futile. You were dead the second you had a headache. You begin hearing things, or not hearing at all as your thalamus goes. You taste sounds, you see smells, everything starts feeling like the most horrifying acid trip anyone has ever been on. With your hippocampus long under attack, you're having trouble remembering things, especially family. You're alone, hallucinating, thirsty, confused, and absolutely undeniably terrified. Everything scares the literal shit out of you at this point. These strange people in lab coats, these strange people standing around your bed crying, who keep trying to get you to drink something and continue crying. And it's only been about a week since that little headache that you've completely forgotten. Time means nothing to you anymore. Funny enough, you now know how the bat felt when he bit you. Eventually, you slip into the dumb rabies phase. Your brain has started the process of shutting down. Too much of it has been turned into a liquid virus. Your face droops, you drool, you're all but unaware of what's around you. A sudden noise or light might startle you, but for the most part, it's all you can do just to stare at the ground. You haven't really slept for about 72 hours. Then you die. Always. You die. And there's not one fucking thing anyone can do for you. Then there's the question of what to do with your corpse. I mean, sure, burying it is the right thing to do, 
but the virus can survive in a corpse for years. You could kill every rabid animal on the planet today. And if two years from now, some moist, preserved, rotten hunk of what used to be brain gets eaten by an animal, it starts all over. So yeah, rabies scares the shit out of me. And it is fucking everywhere. You know, there isn't much that I come across when making videos that actually scare me. When I first came across this post, I found myself actually pausing halfway through to start googling to see if what I was reading was true, and unfortunately, everything is correct. I do want to address one question that is no doubt on everyone's mind, and that would be the Milwaukee Protocol. In short, it's when a person who has contracted rabies is placed into a medically induced coma and is pumped full of antiviral medication. But don't get your hopes up for that working. Since its inception in 2004, the Milwaukee Protocol has been used 26 times, and it has saved one person. And even then, it was no walk in the park in terms of recovery. Gianna Gies was the only survivor of this form of treatment, and after coming out of her coma two weeks later, she essentially had to relearn how to be a functioning person. She had to relearn how to talk, walk, eat, and even sit up correctly. So, if you think that this mysterious sounding treatment will save you, then you have another thing coming. The way to avoid this is probably the next question. The way to avoid this? If you are ever bitten, if it's a dog, if it's a cat, a bat, a coyote, a raccoon, get checked out by a doctor immediately. Do not wait. After all, like that post said, once you start feeling a headache, or maybe a slight backache, you are already dead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 